Welcome to Mighty Married Moms. Join us at our kitchen table twice a week as the Mighty Married Moms, Debbie, Linda, Wendy, invite spectacular guests to weigh in on staying sexy, vibrant, and healthy, building marriages with soul-satisfying connection, raising happy, healthy, successful kids. Conversations with Mighty Married Moms will bring you closer to the life you really want. Episode 83. Hi, this is Wendy Williams, and marriage happiness is way possible. ConnectAgain.org is very happy to sponsor Mighty Married Moms. We are partners in bringing you closer to the life you really want. Visit us today for marriage boosts at ConnectAgain.org. Hi, everyone. Welcome back to Mighty Married Moms. Today, we have the very distinct privilege of being able to share Mm -hmm. with you Annie Fox, who is an internationally respected parenting expert, educator, and a thought leader in the area of teaching kids to be good people in the digital age. She's a contributing writer at the Huffington Post, greatschools.com, and understood.org. And her award-winning books include the Girls Q&A book on friendship, the Middle School Confidential series, and teaching kids to be good people. You can learn more about her at AnnieFox.com. Annie, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for inviting me. This is fun. Good, yeah. good, good. So why don't you, I mean, I just gave a quick introduction, but we would love to hear in your own words, how did you get to where you are today and, and doing the work that you're doing with kids and families? Well, I have an undergraduate background in uh, human development and family studies and a master's in education, but classroom always felt a little bit confining for me. I, I play well with others, but uh, bureaucracy is not my thing. So <laughs> I get that. Yeah. I, had to figure out, I had to figure out a way to um, do what I love to do, which is create content for kids and, and make things that help them get along better with themselves and other people. And so I'm a writer, I'm a teacher. Um, Actually, the big breakthrough moment came for me when I was um, the carpool mom for my daughter and son. They were at opposite ends of of kind of childhood. My son was a sixth grader. My daughter was a 12th grader. Mm -hmm. And I would leave my computer every afternoon happily volunteering to be the carpool mom. We had a minivan at the time, and so I had sixth grade boys in the front and in the back were the 12th grade girls. And in the fall of that year, which was 1996, the girls started talking about where you applying to colleges, et cetera, et cetera. And um, that night, I literally had a dream about a virtual carpool. Hmm, really? The, the internet was just kind of coming around. What I loved about my time with these kids, because they all knew me, is the questions they would ask me, um, the advice I would give. I saw I had a knack for that, and I, I didn't want that to end. Yeah. And so I dreamed of this idea of a virtual carpool on a website that became The Insight, T-H-E-I-N-S-I-T, as in the cool in sight. Oh, okay, okay. And it was a place where kids could really um, find out everything they needed to know about me, myself, and I, about Relationships Unlimited, about social justice issues. Mm. Uh, It was a very broad and deep site. I developed it um, through through a connection with my husband for the company he was working with at the time, TalkCity.com. And um, we launched in June of 97. And on it, I put an advice column called Hey Tara, like Mother Earth Tara. Oh. And the email started coming in. Well, ladies, it's been 18 years, and every single day my inbox is inundated from e- by questions from kids, teens, parents, educators oh. from around the world. And so I'm kind of like a cyberspace Ask Annie. That's, That's fabulous. So great. Yeah, or yeah. cyberspace Dear Abby. <laughs> or like that, right. And, and that that's really has informed all of the work that I have done in the last almost 20 years because the kids write to me and say, Annie, I don't know this. Yeah. I, I, I'm, in a, I'm in a pickle because, because of this. And so the 12 books I've written since that time have really come from the kids saying, we need to know about this stuff. Can you help us? 
And that so, is amazing. How great. You've got wow. you're, you're right on the ground floor of knowing what the mind of these adolescents is. Exactly. Are it, the mind, me. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, that's so awesome. I mean, you know, as entrepreneurs, we're always wanting to find out what really are the challenges of the people that we want to speak to. I mean, boy, they're telling you every single day. That's amazing. Letter yeah. after letter after letter. I'm, yeah, so and you, I'm, I'm probably the second generation of kids too. Yeah, after you. yeah. I'm, sure. I'm so with you on the carpool. That is like the place where mm -hmm. I'm going to miss it. My son is my youngest is going into high school ninth grade, and I've been carpooling with him for ever now and and with a bunch of other kids all in the car and it's almost like I'm sometimes like I'm not even there and yeah. they're just having conversations about everything and anything and yeah. I'm really gonna miss that connection yeah. I, I I really it's you hear everything that's going on with them everything you know especially with the girls and the boys in the car together too because boys will say certain things and girls will tell you about other things and so um, I yeah. found it to be this amazing experience yeah, yeah. Yeah, wow, that's, that's awesome. Thank you so much. Well, Annie, on your website, you have several different points of entry for mm -hmm. teens, parents, and educators. So what are some of those hot-button issues between mm -hmm. those three different constituencies? And are they the same? Are they different? Is there any overlap? Yeah. Yeah, yeah well, I think for parents and teachers, the, the concern is how do we reach the kids? How do we connect mm -hmm. with the kids, especially in the digital age when they're – 24-7, if, if we allow them to be, um, connected with their peer group. We're almost superfluous in many ways. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and since a lot of their communications happen under the radar, and I don't mean that they're sneaking, I mean that we don't hear the conversations. It's going on non-verbally. It's going mm -hmm. on via text. Mm -hmm. yep. and, and so it, it's almost like they're, they're in this cone of silence. <laughs> And, and we're trying to break through the plexiglass, and, mm -hmm. and it becomes more and more difficult, especially because I, I totally believe that there is something called connection addiction. If you try to yeah. extract the phone or the device from your kid's hand, they're going to get snappy with you. Yes, they yes. do. Yeah. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, they're not being rude. It's, it's they have habituated to having this connection. And for them, at this phase in their life, when peer approval addiction is another layer, and I'll, I'll define it for you because I made up the term, okay. it's doing what peer approval addiction is doing whatever it takes to fit in with the group. Yep. Even that stuff you may not be particularly proud of. I, you know, that's true. That is yeah. really true. But the, you would you say, would you say that that when you, the word addiction for me is a, is a, I'm an old nurse or, well, I am old. It's a, compulsive, it's a compulsive behavior you engage in irregardless of the negative consequences. Irregardless, yeah. of, right, exactly. So, so would you say that that there's a slice of all adolescents that have that addiction as opposed to, it's not, every, it's not every adolescent. I know, I'll tell you the truth. I think all human beings are peer approval addicted to some level or yeah, another. Absolutely. You better believe that I, you know, we well, all want see much of what I'm wearing, but I, I made some effort here because <laughs> I know it would be judged. We're visual creatures. Yeah, sure. And we judge each other. And, and um, even and today, more than ever, what you say gets judged immediately. And there can be either a piling on or it goes viral with a thumbs up. And, and, kids are very vulnerable to that at this point in their lives when the thumbs up or the thumbs down of their peer group means everything. Right. Yeah, I've even heard of kids who post something yeah. on social media yeah. and if it doesn't get a certain number of likes, they're yeah. just devastated. Mm -hmm. I mean, my son talks about the likes, everything he posts as well. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, another one that scares me is Snapchat. That's really big now because Snapchat disappears. Mm -hmm. So well, if I wanted to look at it well, it doesn't really you can take screenshots of yep. Snapchat if you're quick. Yeah. Yeah, but but as far as their conversations go, if they don't want to save it and take a screenshot, you know, it's like if I, I could look at my kid's phone and see the texts that they send to each other, but the Snapchat's like you know, yeah, it's just yeah. really it is a, it is a different world. I agree with you, the silence of not hearing their conversations. Not not like when we grew up, right? We had the rotary phone. <laughs> You were trying to stretch the cord. Yeah, all the way to the, the other room. Nobody yeah. would hear you. Right? Hear you? Yeah. yeah, yeah, That's right. Right. No, it's a different world, and and it plays into this um, 
this adolescent need for approval that we all had, but now there's never a break from it. Never, right. never can grow so, out of it. As I say, it ain't easy being them. Mm. It also ain't easy being a parent of a teen. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So true. Well, what are some of the hot button issues? I mean, so you've got the the the, the parents and the educators are worried about how to how connect to reach the kids. Yeah. Yeah. Are there some other issues that parents and kids are, that other adults are worried about? And then we'll get into the kids too. Um, I think they're worried about the influence of the media. Mm -hmm. yeah. We're very worried about that, and and into that mix comes social media, which is the influence of peers. Right. So how do I maintain my parental positive influence on my child when so much of their waking hours mm -hmm. they are um, swimming in a sea of peer influencers? Mm -hmm. Yep. And corporate influencers. Uh, yeah, yes. that's a key. That's Absolutely. A key so that's a that's a huge concern. And again, so that goes back to the first one. It's connection. Mm -hmm. How do I maintain my connection and influence with my child when they are um, spending less and less time with me? You have the answers for them? <sighs> Unplug. Look, look really? I mean, I, I here are some answers. You you need to institute a moratorium weekly on unplugging. Um, mm -hmm. Family dinners. I mean, it sounds quaint. But even, and it doesn't need to be gourmet stuff. You can order out. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the, the physical experience of being around the table, making eye contact with the family, with all digital devices parked outside the door. Right, yeah. And mm -hmm. kids, you know, they, may, they will groan and they will roll their eyes and they'll complain and they'll try to sneak the, the device under the table. Yeah. But if you're, if you're strong about it and you offer them something that they can't get through their peers. That is mm -hmm. acceptance, um, the joy of connecting as a family. So we don't talk about homework or chores. Right. Uh, we don't even have to talk about how was your day, honey. Um, it, it really just becomes a time to just go, ah. Right. You know those times when you're mm -hmm. on vacation and you don't have, have um, internet access? You know, there, there's that impulse to, you want to log on, you want to check your email, you want to do that, and you're, oh. I can't. Okay. <sighs> yeah. 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 <laughs> just can't. so true. Yeah. yeah. And and um, you and I have talked about some of this uh, on your podcast too, which was a lot of fun. Um, but you know the the in terms of the social media and the influence of the technology and everything on the kids. But the thing that's really interesting is the reason that we're addicted. We and I include all of us, most of us at any rate is because of what happens in our brains when we get something something on this little phone, on this thing. You know, it's that dopamine hit. And yeah. dopamine is that pleasure yeah. hormone. And, yeah. oh, somebody liked what I sent. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. And that gives you just a little bit of dopamine. Yeah. And your brain wants to have more of it. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's why we get addicted to this. Yeah. But here's the thing, Debbie. Sometimes what comes through is not a, oh, someone likes me. It's, oh, my God, I'm in trouble with someone. Mm -hmm. Well, that's yeah. scary. Yeah. yeah. And, and then you wonder... Why continue going back to the well if it's so upsetting? Right. If there's a feud playing out between you and your peers on Facebook or, or Instagram or wherever it's happening, and, and it's anything but. Right. But you can, you can ask the same question then about people who are, you know, going to the casinos. They keep putting the money in, hoping for the, hoping for that little win. That's even right. though they keep losing it, they keep losing. It. Oh, I got a little win. Nope, but now I keep losing it. There's Same just thing. enough hope. Just right. enough hope. Right. Yeah, yeah, I think I think that's probably part of our DNA as well. Yeah. Um. There was a girl who wrote to me about some nasty stuff that was going on about her that she says was all lies, and she wrote to me and she said, "How do you convince people that you're telling the truth when no one wants to believe you?" Mm, so yeah. her hope was that if she kept engaging in this um, nastiness, that she could break through win, and be yeah. able to, to say, oh, we're sorry, you were right all along, we were wrong. Not, not going to happen. happen. Not gonna happen. <laughs> it's not going to happen. But it's a hard thing for kids to learn that, I think. It's okay. hard for them to realize that they're not going to influence that. And then uh, uh, and to walk away from it and let go. It's it's really hard, and that's why I do a lot of work in the area of helping kids distinguish between real friends and the other kind. Yeah, mm -hmm. it's yeah. super super important. I think parents can do a lot in that field with. Tell with us, their tell kids. us some more. That's really important. Tell us some more about yeah. that. Well, the idea that 
you should have some standards when it comes to the people that you call your friends. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And you should know really clearly that your gut is going to tell you yeah. that you enjoy being with these people because they're treating you well. Mm -hmm. You can relax with them. You're not worried about some sudden ambush or mm -hmm. not. And if you can relax with someone and feel that it's a mutual respect, then that's gold. And that should be a very high standard for you. And you, right. and you deserve that. Mm -hmm. And so when people start acting murkily and you're not really clear what's up with that, um, that's a time to have a conversation. Mm -hmm. and, to, and, and to empower our, our girls and boys to say, I don't like what you did. What's up with that? And yeah. then close your mouth and listen to what your friend has to say. And, and can they let you know that this is a one-off? I'm really sorry. I was trying to impress those other people. I was way out of line. It won't happen again. You say, mm -hmm. okay, cool. But if it happens repeatedly, and yeah. your sense of trust about who this person is in terms of friend or not friend gets shaken to the point where it's anxiety provoking to be around them that's mm -hmm. the antithesis of what a real friendship is about mm -hmm. and then i tell kids there's always an exit find the exit yes yeah yeah take yeah. a vacation at the very least take a vacation from mm -hmm. this friendship because you need some space to really evaluate what mm -hmm. do i deserve right yeah can uh, sorry can i just ask about because this is i i find myself saying a lot this has been my experience as a mom you know two boys sweet, wonderful, engaged, wonderful kids. And then middle school happened. And middle school, I, I can say it's like the black hole. Like suddenly this amazing kid who was always happy and wanting to do everything and yeah. suddenly I hate myself. I'm stupid. Um, you and know, you're stupid too, mom. Yeah. And like, <laughs> what, what did I do wrong? I mean, my goodness, how, how did that happen? How's my kid? But then I have found my older one, and now my younger is starting high school too, but it was more with my oldest than my youngest, maybe because my youngest was able to hang out with his brother's older friends and, and they were kind of getting along. But my, my oldest really experienced this really tough time in middle school. And then he got into high school and it seemed to, it seemed to level out. Mm -hmm. And now it's, you know, now he's back in a, in a yeah. great place. And, um, and I don't know if that's everybody's experience or. Yes. <laughs> Pretty much. Yeah, but, you know, yeah. And, exactly and you know what they say? They say it's not about you, mom. And it totally isn't. Yeah. But it is so heartbreaking when your sweet little one oh, can find nothing but fault in everything that you do. My son, who I adore, we, we went through that period in middle school. And, um, you know, I would say, tell me, what is it I'm doing wrong here? Yeah. Tell, tell me, I can learn. I'm educable. Right. Tell me, I'll yeah. stop doing that. What is it about me? Too. And you know, know what he said? He said, Mom, everything about you embarrasses me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me something to work with here. <laughs> <laughs> nothing. I got nothing. Nothing. Right. Nothing. But I, that lasted till he was, it started when he was about 12. It lasted till he was about 15. And, and then it just like evaporated and his sweet self came yes. back. Oh, my God. <laughs> Yeah, it evaporated. It was really fascinating. It's like, mm. oh, yeah, there you okay. are. He's back. You, you, you kind of know when they're when they're little, their stages are so much faster, and you go, "This too shall pass." This yeah. too will pass. You yeah, kind of yeah. into that. But then mm -hmm. the middle school thing lasted for so long. <laughs> um, and then the peer groups I found were vicious. Like yes. there was a oh, lot of viciousness awful, going awful. on. And I don't remember it being that uh, intense when I was younger. But then, like you were saying, the social media just. It you know, exacerbates, exacerbates yeah. it. Yeah, and, and you say the social media as if it's something out there, but it, it's really just an unsupervised playground. Right. That's what it is. It's, it's the universe's largest unsupervised playground. You know yeah. what happens yeah, when kids are not supervised. Yes. Their, their basest instincts for survival, and we're talking really about social survival here. Yes. That gets heightened, and they will tear down everyone. And the truth is, underneath all of that, they are very unhappy with themselves. Yep. Right. It's all and, insecurity. And that's, that's where all that grasping and clawing comes from. It's like, I will tear you down before you get a chance to turn the spotlight on me. Yes. Mm -hmm. What's yes. the name of that book they all read in middle school or early high school? Lord of the Flies. Lord of the Flies. Yeah. I hated that book. <laughs> I hated For that, that book. reason. Yeah. yeah. yeah but no, middle, middle school, it's a snake pit. Mm -hmm. It's a snake pit.
Yeah, you know, um, one of the things that you talked about a little bit ago about how to tell a friend, a real friend, from yeah, a from false friend. Yeah. yeah, that reminds me of what I, I t often tell my couples or people that have asked me, how did you, because I got married later in life, I was about 38 years old when I got married, mm -hmm. and I said, I remember when I when Jeff and I got together, it all of a sudden I said, I have never been more Wendy in my entire life. Oh, that's beautiful. And so that's what I heard kind of in between the lines is you want to be with people that, that allow the real you to just be you. Mm -hmm. the good, and they the love bad. it. That's yeah. who they love. The and that's who they love, right. Yeah. Yeah. And so at that, that, that's been a helpful way to kind of gauge that. It's like, I mean, you know, not uh, like I can't speak to, to my husband I do, but uh, maybe not to every girlfriend do I say every thought that comes in my head. But to my husband, you know, I can be, if, if I think it, I can say it out loud and he's not going to run in the other direction. He just doesn't, and I, nor I for him. But that's not, I, but it's a good way of, of, of giving somebody a tool to kind of say, what does it feel like? Can you, can you be the most you with this person? Yeah, Great. That's a very adult realization. Yeah. Even though kids would love to, to be with someone who allows them to be their authentic self, there is no model for it. In, in the seven or eight hours they spend a day with their peers in real life, nor is there a model for it when they spend their after hours online. It's all about facade and masquerading. I mean, really think about it. When yeah. you're online, you can pose and be anything. Absolutely. And if you're not really confident about who you are, you want to try on a whole bunch of different masks to see if and it isn't even really, a, the motivation isn't all, well, maybe for kids it's about masks, but even, I was just reading an article the other day online that said, nobody online is telling 100% of the truth. Everybody looks like they're rich, they're well off, they're having a good time, they're going on great vacations, because you post, look at, we had a great time at, on vacation, and you don't post the other things where everybody's at each other's throats because it's yeah. raining out and you want to kill each other. So you don't post that, go, here's my husband looking like a real ass, you know, whatever. You don't post that. You just say, oh, ha, ha. and it's not, we're not trying to be false, but what we put online is our not the wins, whole truth. our it's wins. Not the whole truth. It's not the yeah. whole truth. And who would, mm -hmm. you know, you wouldn't. Right. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing, the whole online world for all of us, adults and children. I, I just thought of something else about a post that I wrote recently about kids and making mistakes and mm -hmm. why it's, it's brilliant and, and very healthy to encourage our kids yep. to make mistakes, not just to accept their mistakes, but to encourage them to make their mistakes. Make the mistakes. Um, that's where you learn. That's where you learn. Yeah. Uh huh. And so that if we were on vacation and we took a wrong turn and we ended up in this really awful place and we were at each other's throats, that was a mistake on a lot of levels. What can we learn from the fact that we, how we interacted with this sudden thing that we were faced with? Right. We could have handled it better in the car. <laughs> yeah, we were stressed. We will be stressed again and again, but we weren't our best selves. So this idea of, hey, mistakes happen. And, and, and then you see you learn from them. If you're smart, you learn from them. Right. right. So if I stumble in class and people laugh at me, is my day over? How do I process it, you know? Right, right. Yeah, yeah. No, this, that's great stuff that we should be teaching our kids. And, you know, Carol Dweck has written, you know, this great book about mindset, which is the same thing about how we do need to acknowledge the fact that we make mistakes, and that's great because that's the only way you can make forward progress, too. Mm -hmm. right. So yeah, that's right. but instead we're often pointing out our kids' mistakes. You didn't do right. this, you didn't do that, right? Yeah. I expect teaching, more of you. Teaching you know that, than that, yeah, teaching that persistence and going after it and picking yourself up. Can you imagine if the first time your toddler raised themselves to their little feet and they were holding onto the table and they fell down? You went, "Well, that was stupid." <laughs> <laughs> right? I mean, it's ridiculous. We all just go, good job, try it again, yep, yeah. and wipe their little eyes, and you just keep encouraging yep. them to keep going. Because we're not, ex we shouldn't be expecting perfection, we're only looking for progress. Exactly, exactly. exactly. Right. You know, I would like to change, we're, we're almost out of time here, but I want to change. Uh, what? Very How did that happen? <laughs> we're not ready to end either. No. <laughs> Can you just talk really quickly about relationships between mothers and daughters? Nah, mm -hmm. I had a mother. <laughs> I have a daughter. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that can be, gosh. That can be um, full of all kinds of stuff. Yeah, Static. It's true. It's true. And the stuff can be really good. 
Mm-hmm. And it could be not so good. I think from my own experience, as a, as a daughter who felt that um, I had an overbearing mother in some, in some cases, that um, more space would have been appreciated. Um, mm-hmm. Respect for my boundaries would have been appreciated. Acknowledgement for who I was versus maybe who she wanted me to be. Mm. It's, very, it's very difficult. I think sometimes we're easier on our sons because we don't have an image of what a perfect, you know, boy ought to be necessarily. But we have in our mind how we want our girl to turn out. Mm. That's not always fair. She is who she is. She is not us. As my daughter, when she was six years old, <laughs> I have to tell this story really quickly because it's sure. great. Um, my daughter is probably the most right-brained person I've ever met. Me, she's nonlinear and very imaginative. Always was. Um, she had uh, a year ago had her first novel published. She's she's a writer. She's a, she's just very creative. She's always that way. But when it's time to get up and get ready to go to school, there's a, a list of linear tasks you have to finish to get yourself out the door. Um, okay, she was in first grade. She needed to put on her shoes and socks, come downstairs to breakfast, and uh, get herself out the door. Mm-hmm. And I left her with one sock on, and I said, okay, I'll meet you downstairs, and um, we'll have breakfast. And five minutes went by, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, I went back upstairs. She had both socks on her hand, and she was doing sock puppets with oh, great dialogue mm-hmm. and songs, so creative. And I'm like, whoa, do you know what time it is? It's taken, it wouldn't take me this long to put on socks. <laughs> she just looked at me and she said, Mom, I'm not you. And that was, that was it for the rest of your lives together, right? I'm not I'm you. I'm not you. Mm. I'm not you. My mom thought I should be her. Right. Okay. My daughter at age six said, Mom, I'm not you. Mm. Yep. That, that little girl right now is at Burning Man. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow <laughs> she the creative spirit has always been that way yeah. so so it's like i'm not you should be and and do we love them for who they are right yeah. right do we admire things that they know and do and sense that we don't right yeah that is such a gift and i'm i, I wish i could tell you that i had a i have a very close relationship with a mom who has been trying to design her children all along design them to be, you know, golfers and businessmen and whatever. And the real person that's there has never been allowed to emerge and be, and be applauded. And it's, it's been a hard thing to stand by and watch. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. So, so the advice for moms and daughters is back off enough so you can actually see who your daughter is. Mm-hmm. She's not you, mm. which is not a bad thing. Right. <laughs> but she can learn from you and you can learn tons from her right 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 that's I, awesome i like that learn from her too yeah right. well obviously she got the biggest lesson ever from that little six i'm not you oh yeah and she wasn't being snippy with <laughs> me right. like, oh you don't know this let me tell you something mom yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's right yeah that's i'll right. tell you my right. kids have said the same thing to me they weren't six they were a little bit older but yeah they said this i'm not like you mom yeah <laughs> like Okay. okay. <laughs> I can deal. Yeah. You know, I think a lot of us also try to live out some idealized mother-daughter relationship through our daughters. Temperament may prevent that. True. You know, a sense True. of boundaries, introvert versus extrovert may prevent that. Um, find the meeting places where you find them and respect the boundaries. Once your daughter is, I'm saying middle school. You should be stepping back each year as she steps up to find out her own life and then let her call the shots in terms of how much intimacy with you she wants. Mm. You could say the same thing about boys too. You absolutely can. Just because we have these digital devices that allow us to connect with them 24-7 doesn't mean that we need to be doing it. Oh my goodness, yeah. We've we've had some wonderful other folks who are singing off the same song page as you, you know, back when the four of us were coming up and at college, did your mother have any idea what courses you were picking out or if you were going to class or not? And now kids are texting, how much laundry soap do I put in the laundromat, mom? And we just yeah. have to stand at the pay phone and on Sunday nights in the dorm and wait in line to be yeah. able to call your parents once a week. Yep. Never mind this every five minutes. Yep. Yep. It's a very you know, di- it's, So what comes with that is that if we scaffold them that much, mm-hmm. if we over-parent, 
then we are raising under functioning kids. Absolutely. Right. right. Yep. Exactly. And what if they couldn't ask you about about the soap detergent? They'd find out. Right. right. And and so I, I, I think totally. what happens with moms especially is that we equate being needed with being loved. Mm. Yeah. Oh, oh, she doesn't know this about this. She needs me. She needs me to tell right, her this. Right. So we reinforce this. It's enabling. It is. It, it is. is. And talk so, about stunting your own growth as a human being. Like oh if you're consumed with need, fulfilling the needs, like you're just kind of stalled on your own process. You're so right. So when your kids go off to college, you want to continue being the parent that you were when they were six. And they right. don't need that unless you somehow convince them they still need you that way, but you're totally stalled and you have to redefine yourself. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, and, it, and it, it can be really hard, but you should start doing that in middle school as a parent. Start mm -hmm. redefining yourself because your days of parenting under the same roof are numbered. Right, they're numbered. I, I heard a, a very interesting talk a few weeks ago. I shared this with the, the other moms a few weeks ago, and that is we start off our parenting as a commander you know, eat this, you know, you need to finish the food, then you turn into a coach, doing a good job in the, school, you know, the grade school years, then we turn into a counselor in the high school time, uh -huh. and into a like consultant that. when they're adults. You're a consultant, absolutely. And then, as a parent, then your kids become your consultant when you're getting older, they become your counselor, then your coach, you're doing a good job with that walker mom, <laughs> and then they become your commander. Like, okay, we're going to the doctors. Taking and the drink, keys away from the car. Drink, drink more water. <laughs> yeah, drink more water, right. Yeah, get it. Brilliant. But yeah, isn't that yeah. something? I love that. that. It's really, really interesting. Yeah. I like that. Yeah. I like that a lot. Yeah. We, we need to stop. This has been okay. <laughs> Annie Fox, thank you so much for being Maybe with us Maybe you would today. come back again, though, because we have more we want to talk to you. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'd be totally. happy to do that. Oh. Absolutely. Please. Well, um, why don't you get, tell people anything you want to tell us about your book. I know you've got a great book. Uh, where to find you online. Any, any projects you've got coming up. Go ahead and yeah. share. Okay, quickly. Um, I've, got, I've got 12 books, literally, <laughs> and, and one in the making. There's one over my shoulder here. It's okay. called oh. Teaching, Teaching Kids to Be Good People. Yeah. Progressive Parenting for the 21st Century. It's a very interactive book. It's a very personal book. And um, yeah, it, it's really about helping kids develop a moral compass in, in the digital age yeah. where um, who they hang out with and those influencers may not be um, reflecting the values that you would want to instill in your kids. So you mm. need to, that's, that's a good book. Yeah. Um, mostly I write for kids. I have a middle school confidential graphic novel and app series that's quite popular in middle schools. Um, I've got my new girls book, the girls Q&A book on friendship, 50 ways to fix a friendship without the drama. I like oh, that a lot. very good. Very good for eight to 12 year old girls. You have to be. Oh, really? okay. <laughs> eight to 12 year old girls. But, but I think parents should read it too so that they, okay. they can really um, help, their help their girls figure it mm -hmm. out. Yeah. And currently I am working on a novel. I am I'm writing a teen novel about teen suicide. And mm. um, though it sounds very heavy, and it is in a way, it, there's a lot of humor in it because the dead girl is one of the characters, and she's no angel. <laughs> Interesting. And she's oh not done yet. <laughs> okay, okay. Well, I can't wait to read it. Yeah. That sounds good. I can't wait to finish it. <laughs> yeah, I know what happens. <laughs> We will be looking for that. Yeah. yeah. Well, um, but basically, if you just go to AnnieFox.com, you can find out everything about me. Okay. Awesome. Right. Terrific. Well, Annie, everyone, A N N I A N N I E. Just want to make sure everybody knows. A N N I E F O X one X. Okay. <laughs> AnnieFox.com. Great. Well, everybody, this is this has been a fabulous conversation with Annie Fox. We are the Mighty Married Moms yes. at MightyMarriedMoms.com. I am Debbie Owen from You Can Raise Great Kids. I'm Wendy Williams from connectagain.org. And I'm Linda Tai from All Well Breaks Loose. And we would love to have our viewers and listeners go to iTunes and please leave us a rating and a review and share the show with your friends and uh, tell everybody about the great conversation we just had with Annie Fox. Yeah. So thanks, everybody, for being here, and we will see you next time. And thank you so much, Annie. Thank you, Annie. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you for joining us for this episode of Mighty Married Moms. Tune in twice a week on Mondays and Thursdays to meet fascinating and inspiring guests who will help you create the life you've always wanted. 
You can find these episodes and special gifts just for you at MightyMarriedMoms.com, as well as a link to our Facebook community, where we continue the conversation around the kitchen table. Please also help share the love by leaving a review on iTunes. We'll see you next time.